Praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, content director for the Fatima Center, joined once again by my good friend, Kevin Rorty of Soka, Souls of the Christian Apostolate. Welcome, Kevin. Hi, David. Good to be here. It's good to have you again. I'm pretty uh, excited about this show. It's one I've been waiting for for a long time because uh, we're going to talk about our predominant fault. And uh, this is, again, sort of a similar maybe intro to what I did last time where I, I, I've grown up Catholic all my life, you know, going to Sunday Mass all my life and even went to seminary. OK, I was in the seminary for several years. Uh, this is all before I knew about the traditional Latin Mass, by the way, in the recovery and restoration of tradition. Um, and and had never heard about predominant fault. So didn't even never know. Once. To, never once. Didn't know like to, I mean, if I did hear it, it went over my head, right? That's possible. So I shouldn't just say I never heard of it. Let me say that I never heard of it in such a way that it made any kind of impression on me. And I thought it was something important and anything I should pay attention to. And again, this is even in years of seminary formation, Mm -hmm. um, which, which now that I understand more about the predominant fault, I realize how, how utterly miserable, pathetic, how horrific that is, and you know why sometimes we're in the state of affairs we are in the in the spiritual life, the interior life of, of the church and us Catholics, if if we don't even know anything about this. So I do say this also as a way of prelude because if you are anything like me and don't know anything about the predominant fault, uh, I was there too. Uh, don't feel bad. That is part of I think the reality we're living in these days within uh, you know the the post Vatican II church. Uh, so we're going to talk about it. We're going to learn a little bit about it and. There is much more that could be said, I'm sure, that Kevin and I can cover uh, in this episode. So it may be something we revisit at other times. Um, But that's the thing. We're going to talk about the predominant fault today, your predominant fault, my predominant fault, because everyone's got one. Uh, Let's go ahead and start with prayer, Kevin. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Veni Sancte Spiritus, reple tuorum corda fidelium, et tui mori senis inemeshende. Mite Spiritum tuum et creabuntur. Et renovabis. Facim terre. Oremus. Deus qui corda fidelium sancti spiritus illustratione docuisti, da nobis in eurem spiritu recta sapere, et de eus semper consolatione gaudere, per Christum dominum nostrum. Amen. Nomine Patris et Filius Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, uh, Kevin, maybe that's just the way to start. Um, let's, uh, let's pretend, let's step into my little time machine and go back some 10, 15 years, actually a little bit more even, 20 years, uh, I'm in the seminary and I know nothing about predominant fault. And so here comes this speaker to our our class and he says, you know, what's your predominant fault? You're not gonna grow in virtue. You're not gonna go in the interior life if you you aren't fighting your predominant fault. So I look at you and I say, what is that? What are you talking about? Yeah, well, this topic really is the entrance into a whole realm in the spiritual life is coming to a greater uh, self-knowledge. Um, I know someone that they started going to confession more frequently in the beginning of their spiritual life. And they uh, started really dissecting more of their venial sins and, um, and, and even frequency of those falls. And the priest told them, Hey, you know, that you should be encouraged because you're now gaining more self knowledge you're not just like well i know this was a mortal sin and i happen to fall into it or I, I i i committed this sin you know this major sin it's like i'm really trying to understand the the thoughts i'm having and the things that i'm willing even that aren't the most visible externally and that's he's like that's a real development in the spiritual life he told this person so um i think that this this whole realm of self knowledge is associated with the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, because the fear of the Lord entails knowing who you are before God in, in, in a sense that I'm dependent. I don't have all this control. Our ego is so inclined towards saying I'm, I'm puffed up. I'm this big thing. I have all this control. Whereas, you no, know, we are this little, you know, dependent being on God. You know, our life is like that. It's just like, you know, we're, we're just like a speck of sand in the timeline of the universe. And so our soul is completely dependent on God. And that's, that's the beginning of, of wisdom. And wisdom does entail a certain form of self-knowledge of who we are before God. The flip side of that is knowing that we're made in the image and likeness of God and grace elevates us in a miraculous way to divine life, which is amazing. Um, and so the predominant fault is a part of this general 
uh, realm of self-knowledge that we'll dive into more. There's other things like our temperament, our particular attraction of grace, our plan of life. Um, when it comes to, you know, what habits am I going to develop? Um, what does my particular examination of conscience look like, et cetera. But we'll start with the predominant fault. You could def define your predominant fault as sort of the weak spot in your interior life. Oftentimes it's the pull from what your main attraction of grace is. So typically you're going to be drawn by something in the spiritual life. That's really going to lead to your, those moments of conversion or of like, man, I'm all in for this. Or this is what, like some people, it might be, they're really drawn to the peace of God and that God is someone you can rest in and trust some to the apostolic side. We're going to go and do this amazing, amazing apostolic project to save souls, you know, or to defend the truth, you know, um, there's, there's a whole variety of different attraction of graces, but often associated with that there's a flip side typically of things that um, we fall into an in excess or defect um, with that virtue or that good that we're aiming for. Um, and in, it's important to look past um, mere inclinations with the predominant faults, you know, oftentimes it may not just be like the most common sin that we have that, that externally or the most serious sin externally. Now, for example, someone might have a problem um, that, with um, like temperance, you know, um, but they, uh, but, but they constantly are, you know, committing like grave sins of uh, who knows, using our Lord's name in vain, for example, you know, let's say they're, they're constantly doing that. Um, but beneath it all, there's, there's a deeper root of what ultimately leads to that tipping point with other sins. So typically the predominant fault may not be the most visible thing externally, but it's what underlies the, the other faults that come out. So some examples might be things like vanity or avarice or pride or sloth or cowardice or intemperance, et cetera. There's, there's so many different you know, possibilities of what it might be. Um, but getting to this really gets to the heart. It unravels a lot of the other faults that this is sort of the, the apex, the center of where those other faults come from. Um, so again, this is the, the, the predominant faults as the weak spot in our interior life. This is what, if you're thinking you're in a war, a war for your soul, the devil is like, okay, I know that this is where they have a weakness and I'm going to try to use that, make them fall in this area. They have armor all over, but they have a weak spot here. I'm going to go for that. And then then it's going to spread to the rest of the body, so to speak. Um, and so that's how we generally look at the predominant fault. Okay. So um, just to review real quick or encapsulate uh, also in some sort of like, uh, I think we see your know, grace builds on nature. So obviously a lot of things we see in the life of the spiritual life, the interior life will have its parallels in the natural life. Uh, and so you start out by saying, you know, the attraction of grace, we could say that a lot of times we know for people, their great strength can also be their greatest weakness, yep. right? You'll, you'll see that. And so I think that can kind of be connected. I mean, there's a, we, we see these examples all the time. I mean, if someone's a civil war buff and I've just kind of gotten into that a little bit because my family was out traveling, we did this whole Fatima tour out east. So we were visiting places yeah. like Gettysburg and Antietam. So we're learning about the civil war. We're studying Robert E. Lee. Um, and of course, many people will talk about how maybe Sharpsville, Charlottesburg was, was Lee's greatest victory, but then he's up at Gettysburg and that's his greatest defeat. Um, but when you sort of study the military tactics Lee was, was probably following, I think you can understand why he made the mistakes he did at Gettysburg because it fits into that same sort of character pattern that he had on, on why he also got the great victories. You know, it's yep. just the circumstances got tweaked a little. He didn't have all the right info. He didn't have the right, the correct right-hand man. And so that greatest weakness, I mean, the greatest strength kind of became his greatest weakness. And in his own memoirs, he talked about he kind of never lived down the, the various, let's say, strategic mistakes he made at Gettysburg. So that's just one little incident on a natural level in a man's life. But we can see how your great strength can also kind of like a flip side of it. It works together with the great weakness. Um, yep. So that's kind of what we're talking with the predominant fault, right? And how yep. it comes to knowledge. Okay. Very yeah, good. You can think of people that, that are inclined to that peace and, um, you know, gentleness by inclination, you know, they may also have a serious fault of slothfulness, you know, of not having enough drive, not having enough energy uh, to try to live virtuously, for example, you know. Yep. Yeah, no, and I mean, I was going to say another one. I think I think you use it well with the armor, or even with your with your fortifications in a citadel. If if your soul is a citadel, and you've got the the strong walls that grace and virtue put up, yeah. 
there will always be that that one sort of weak spot in the fortifications. And, and we've all seen, you know, movies where they attack the city and you know, there's that one point where the enemy wants to hit and if they can break things down there, then the enemy just can pour into the citadel and, yeah. and take it over. And then you're, you're suffering a lot more. So then that predominant fault is going to be the, the weak spot. And of course, if one is aware of the weak spot, then you bring in your own big forces and, and you fight. And again, that, that becomes sort of like the main battle, uh, yeah. main point of battle or, or the main point of fighting in this battle just like for the fight for your eternal soul, that's going to become sort of like the main point of battle where the devil's coming with his enemy forces and you've got to marshal your own forces and grace and guard angels to fight there. If you win there, boom, you're going to win. If you lose there, ah, uh, you're going to have to fall back and retreat. And <laughs> then you got to rely on some other things, I guess, in our analogy might not work there. Um, yep. The other thing I thought was just that another way of looking at it, and that's actually the one that helped me, I think, the most is when they told me, it's not so much like you said, the sin you commit the most often, let's say, or even, you know, the worst sin you've committed, the one that you sort of feel the greatest contrition over. It's often more subtle and more hidden, but more pervasive. And yeah. that it kind of acts like a root in your soul to all these other sins. So you see, you know, we don't see the root in a tree. We, we see the branches, we see the fruit, we see the leaves. So with our sin, we're seeing like the leaves and the trees and the branches. And those are the things that we're confessing right? Because we see them and we're aware of them and we certainly feel contrition over them. But if we could trace down and sort of start asking ourselves, well, why did I do that sin? Uh, being curious about our own, you know, tendency, our concupiscence yeah. tendency to sin. And then we could go underneath and get to a root. And then we followed another one and it kind of got us to the same root. And then we followed another sin and we start following all these different sins. We start saying, wow, you know, I've committed whatever, a hundred sins today. And if I start tracing back, I can see how 85 of them kind of have a, the basic root here. That's the same thing. Then yeah. that's how I start getting to my predominant fault. And so I had always thought my predominant fault was one thing. When I got that analogy of the root, I, I started thinking a little differently and so now I'm sort of thinking, no, this other thing is my predominant fault. Mm -hmm. Using mostly that root analogy is how I sort of um, been looking at it. So it's helped me. Yeah, no, and I, it, let's, I'll use a very clear example of not necessarily this would be a predominant fault, but that this is a way of seeing how there are deeper roots to things. So a very common thing today would be people feel like they may waste a lot of time on social media or the internet in general oftentimes because they got the portable device. And if you think, okay, what led to you spending all that time? Well, I probably just shouldn't have got on in the first place. You know, I didn't do it intentionally. What I did was I just spontaneously decided I was going to look what led to that. Well, uh, you know, this stressful thing happened, you know, there's something that created stress. Maybe it was some conflicts, you know, um, they maybe, someone insulted them in some way, uh, you know, maybe their pride was hurt, their ego was hurt, their vanity was hurt in some way. And so now they're going to distract themselves or seek affirmation in some other fashion, you know, okay, boom, I'm, I'm going to use my phone to, to, to lure me in away from those thoughts. Okay. So really the origin of spending, let's say they, they binge for two hours, just scrolling through stuff on the internet. The origin of that was something deeper that that first clicked you know, that was underlying that activity. So that's just one example to see that there are these deeper, deeper motives that underlie these more surface level faults that we commit. Um, unless no, you want to comment on that, I'll go over. I was going to say that's, that's, that's a very, very good and accurate statement. Um, I think a lot of times people don't realize that that's kind of why they often are going to those devices. And uh, obviously there's addictive things there. There's the dopamine levels, but there is still something that clicks you and gets you going. Um, and that's what we're talking about here. What is it that first clicks and gets you moving in that direction? Let's say away from God, away from virtue. You know, can you identify that? So I don't know if you want to talk about how you identify it or why it's important to identify it. Um, either yep. one of those. Yeah, we'll go through how to identify it and how to overcome it. Um, but I would say it, with regard to that particular example, you know, part of it's also understanding virtue isn't just a mere absence of vice. It's, it's really, it's, it's a living a life that is uh, in accordance with human nature and supernatural virtue uh, in accordance with your divine, you know, eternal purpose, so to speak. And, um, and so it's a matter of having drive, you know, that, that there's a, there's an absence of drive and, and intention to live a good life there, typically sort of void um, that. So anyway, um, so first, how to identify it, then how to overcome it. 
Um, the beginning of trying to identify your, your predominant fault begins with prayer. So um, I, we've talked a lot about mental prayer in this series. If you're just doing that, you know, oftentimes people can get really nitpicky about trying to figure out what is their exact predominant fault, or even just doing a lot of examination of conscience, you know, with a certain good zeal that goes sideways a bit where you become nitpicky about certain little things, but you miss like, okay, I need to be setting aside 15 minutes, just conversing with God because he's ultimately the one who's going to fix this. So the first part of that prayer is allowing the Holy ghost to come in and enter your soul and inviting the Holy ghost to be, to really be a temple of the Holy ghost as St. Paul says, because, you know, I talked to a psychologist once who was visiting the monastery I was discerning with, and I'm really interested in psychology and I wanted to understand, you know, well, how do you, how do you reconcile like psychology? How do you understand, you know, what are your deeper motives and faults and all? And she said, well, you know, ultimately it's, it's the gifts of the Holy ghost that allow us to see ourselves most fully. It's God who will oftentimes very subconsciously like direct us in the right ways. You know, he's the best therapist. He's the best counselor, truly, literally, you know, the, the, the Holy ghost is the counselor, you know, the sanctifier. Um, the, the fire in our souls that that burns up these faults and in ways that we don't even fully see so spending that time is so critical um is speaking with god then also petitioning our lady of sorrows and our guardian angel uh those are the two particular devotions um that are very helpful um father ripperger talks about this for identifying and overcoming our predominant faults uh, obviously, I mean, it's, I think it's pretty obvious why you're guardian angel um, and why prayer is so important. Do you have any insight into why invoking our Blessed Mother under that, that title of Our Lady of Sorrows is particularly helpful in this case? Yeah, I think I think it has to do with the prophecy of Simeon. Uh, I've, I, do, I do not, um, to my chagrin as a Catholic, uh, I do not have it memorized. Well, the what fact the that the sword will pierce her heart and will reveal the thoughts of That's it. I mean, reveal. That, that was the word. Yeah. Yes. So it will reveal that's basically Our Lady of Stars. There's this particular grace with yes. regard to revelation. And so revealing to us, you know, what our deepest fa failings are, that's that's why it's associated, I, I think. Well, and even I, I mean, in that image, it makes a lot of sense because it's the sorrow that will be caused in her heart. And obviously the sorrow in her heart is over man's offenses against God, uh, you know, the outrages against her son. And so that makes sense in that connection, that that's what, you know, revealing the thoughts of many there is uh, connected to the, the sorrow that pierces her heart and that pierces, obviously, our Lord's heart, because the sacred and immaculate hearts are really just one mystical heart. Okay, good. Yeah, and, and I would add on that, I think if you, I think another reason why that, that fits is because if you think of Our Lady, she, she is so pure. She just saw truth and saw the love of our God and how despicable and ugly sin really is. If you take a thousand foot view, you know, you, you're dead. You've seen, you've seen every, you, you, all, all judgment has passed and you've seen your life. The amount of contrition we'll have for any little sin when we see just how lovable God is and how good he is and how merciful he is to, to sin against him, you know, will just, it really, that image, you know, I, I have the image of our lady of sorrows in my room here, you know, and you see the sorrow on her face and she's pierced with seven swords. Uh, like that's that image that, that, that devotion is, really really captures just how just deadly this these faults that we have are you know we'll look back and be like man just how uh, you maybe you have contrition for certain sins in your past um you know or, or people you you've harmed in different ways and you're just like what was it like how ugly how evil that was you know and that's how you know we really need to see this predominant fault you know it isn't just like you know, a self-improvement book. It's really like a sin against almighty and all good God um, that Our Lady of Cyrus helps reveal to us. Now, the other thing that just came to me right now that I really like about the, the prophecy of Simeon is, of course, that's where we get the Nunc Dimittis, which is that canticle that we pray as part yeah. of night prayer, uh, which is where Simeon is talking about the light, that the Christ is the light of the Gentiles. And so even in the Fatima Center's uh, the little rosary booklet, if you have it, when you turn to the book, the page on the fourth mystery, and then the images there just come from the Basilica of, of Lourdes, actually over in, in France. Uh, you know, our, our photographer, she went out there, she took pictures of them. We put them in the booklet so it'd have all the 15 mysteries in a matching way. But there is this big image of a light, of a candle on that fourth mystery. And that always reminds me very strongly of the 
Psalm 42, in three by that a day, right? My favorite, one of my favorite lines, and I pray it every time I go to mass and I dwell on it and I meditate on it is, is luce tuam et veritatem tuam, right? Send forth thy light and thy truth. Uh, we're asking God for that light, for that grace. How desperately we need his light and his grace. But I connect that with Simeon, with Simeon's prophecy, with Our Lady of Sorrows, a sword piercing our heart. At Fatima, I mean, we could really, that's one way of describing Fatima. Our Lady came because God was sending forth his light and his truth, yeah. right? Our, even the children talk about how she's dressed and her dress was like, they talk about it, it was like she was dressed in light that, that she didn't actually like to have like cloth vestments, but like it was layers of light that yeah. she was. And of course she brings us the truth at Fatima. She's talking so much about the importance of truth, even the dogmas of the faith. So, I mean, there's this powerful connection between light and your truth from the Old Testament and the Psalms through the mass, what we're praying for all the time at mass, what Our Lady of Fatima brings connected with the fourth mystery and how much we need that light and truth to know ourselves, right? The light and the yeah. truth that we need, we need God's grace and his truth to peer into our own soul. And so we got to pray that. Um, and so that's part of that prayer that Kevin's talking about. I think to the Holy Ghost, ask him, send forth thy light and thy truth. You yeah. know, send it to me because otherwise I won't, won't know these things. And just yeah. on the, I mean, on the last side note, that is again, one of the great travesties that in making all the changes to the mass, they completely cut out Psalm 42, the intri yeah. and, and so we don't even pray it. So people who are not assisting at the Latin Mass are not praying on a regular basis. Their life of prayer is not being formed by that prayer, Psalm 42, where it's so important that we ask God to send his light and his truth. Right. So, um, yeah, that connects us to Our Lady of Sorrows also. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so to, how do, how, how do I, I uh, identify it in a practical way, you know, through examination of conscience? Um, so the, the most basic question, basic question we could ask would be, what are the most common preoccupations that spontaneously arise in my thoughts? Okay. So what am I most, what am I preoccupied with most commonly? Okay. And then you can ask, what is the root of that? Like if it's McDonald's, you know, maybe it's like intemperance, you know, or gluttony. Okay. You know, a lot of people... Yeah, I, I'd say a lot of people might think that lust is their predominant fault today, especially a lot of men. Uh, it may be for some, I, I, but I do think it needs to get deeper than that because a lot of times I know people that struggle with certain addictions related to lust. And the what I brought up about the phone earlier, um, typically there are things that spur them to, right. like they go down a, a line of, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I don't feel good, I'm discouraged. I feel like I've already sinned and now I just give in to something really bad, you know? And so, um, so th you know, and I, I mean, just to, just to really emphasize that, I mean, for, for men, I, I have read that, that for men who do have a problem, um, with let's say pornography, which is a serious problem. I mean, statistics are saying that well over 70% of men have a problem with that. Oh yeah. It's um, more than that. Yeah. Probably more than that. Right. And so, uh, but again, it's, it's very important, I think, to realize that a lot of times, what is it, just like we talked about with the phone, what is it that clicked you, got you going, so you started moving in that direction? Um, that's the very obvious sin, but something got you going. And again, you know, like for married men, a lot of times it's that they just, they're not connected to their wife or they don't feel connected to her or they felt disrespected by their wife or they felt that she wasn't there for them or, uh, you know, they feel lots of other things, but there's usually something else that's going on in them that then pushes them in that direction very often. And so that's what we're talking also again about a root, right? The, the root might be more there. And that's where you might be able to be able to identify the predominant fault that leads you to these greater, more obvious external faults that bring about more shame and that you will often feel more contrition for afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and so we have to recognize in trying to answer this question, what are the most common preoccupations I have? What are at the root of that? Um, it's going to take time to discern this. So don't feel like you got to figure it out right away. You know, it's going to, it might take a long time to really discern this. So be patient with it. Um, you can ask your confessor if you have someone you typically go to confession with what they think that it might be and ask people close to you as well what they think, you know, you could ask what are my general faults or something like that. And that, you know, that can be a really humbling uh, thing to do. Um, you know, in religious life, you know, we, that was a more, uh, I mean, the people that were your mentors or whatever, people you live with on a day-to-day -day basis, they saw like the ins and outs of your, your life. And so, you know, it's, it can be very humbling to ask that question. But uh, as the novice master in the order I was with said, you know, we are not good judges of ourselves. 
Um, we really are not, we, we think we understand ourselves well. And then, you know, sometimes we're really narrowed in on this one thing and this other big major obvious thing over here, like the elephant in the room, we, we don't see the elephant, you know, we see the tiny little bug and there's this elephant over here. So, uh, we got to ask people what the, that elephant is. That can be very helpful. I mean, that's what the spiritual authors have always said. That's why they've always had, you know, the, the saints always would have their own spiritual directors or confessors or theologians they go to for questions or whatever, because they didn't trust themselves, not in a, an unhealthy, like, you know, self, you know, defecating way, but in a way of like, I know I can twist my own way of seeing myself. And so I'm going to get, you know, an, you know, a, a wise opinion on this and maybe a second or third opinion, you know, if it's like a moral question or something like that. So, um, okay. Yeah, so I mean, ask, ask your spouse if you're, if you're able yep. to, you know, and again, hopefully the, the spouses act with charity one towards the other yeah, and, and are really doing it for the good of the other, not to, you know, load up your arsenal of weaponry that you're going to attack your spouse with. That's never good. (laughs) You know, I'll let you know. Yeah, no, but I mean, a spouse can certainly help. Um, And like you say, good friends. So talk to others about it because it is true. We, we usually don't know ourselves very well when it comes to these things. Uh, We're we're kind of blind to our own serious faults. So uh, confessor, talk to him, Uh, examination of conscience, pray, talk to others that are close to you that know you well and have your real genuine good and salvation of soul at heart. And, and I know some people that go to confession and they say, you know, it's been so uh, however long since the last confession and they state what they, their predominant fault is or what they think it is um, to give the confessor some sense of, you know, um, that, that's just something I, I know at least one person who does that. And I think that's, that's a, a praiseworthy practice. Um, some other things, look at your patterns in confession. What are you continually confessing? Uh, what are the, what's the general cause of your joy and what's the general cause of your sadness? Typically, that's another way to kind of get to the root of a lot of these things. Um, and this is a really piercing question. What sin is in the corner of my heart that I'm holding on to deeply that I don't want to give to our blessed Lord. You know, if I really ask myself that seriously, like I don't want to have to actually address this. You know, like this, this really is going to be a lot of work. I have been basically procrastinating it, blotting out of my mind, out of my spirit. I don't want to deal with that. Um, that, that, that can be a real piercing question. Um, and bring, you could bring that to prayer and talk with our Lord about it. Um, some other things, what are the things I'm most passionate about? Um, what passion shows up in nearly everything I do? So some of the passions, there's love and hatred, desire, aversion, joy or delight sorrow slash grief or pain, um, hope, despair, fear, daring, anger. These are all the different, there's like 11 passions, you know, from a Thomistic standpoint, but what are the, what are the, the, the common, you know, you call them feelings, passions, emotions that you see pervasive among a lot of the things that you do. Um, and that'll help also you identify the, the kind of root fault here. Um, anything you wanted to talk about with regard to that, David? No, no, those sound pretty good. Um, and I know we're, we're, again, we're closing in on our, our time limit. So let's get to, um, once you identify it, what do you do with it? Yeah, so um, this is what's recommended. And I would recommend people to go look up, if you want to learn more about this, uh, what Gary Gou Lagrange says on the predominant fault, you can Google it and you'll find it. Um, it's in the three ages of the interior life. Um, have a sanction, okay? So you could have some sort of penance that you do, Um you know, maybe a little prayer that you say, you know, if you can, maybe you strike your breast if you realize you've committed this fault. Um, but you don't want to do it too, obviously, like you don't want other people to know. So if you're striking your breast, like, you know, it might look weird to people. So, um, uh, I, w- I would try to find another way just to kind of like note, okay, I did that. Um, and, uh, and then have a particular examination, St. Ignatius of Loyola talks about the difference between a general examination. That's just like, you think about the last day or the last week. Okay. What were the things that I did wrong as, you know, sinful. And then the difference in that in a particular examination, that's like a very particular fault that I'm trying to overcome or virtue I'm trying to gain. And I, and he, he says, he recommends having tallies of how many times throughout the day that that happened, uh, or that you overcame it. Um, and so, uh, so that's how uh, you can kind of have a sanction to really be clear about trying to grow and, and get over the hump with this predominant fault. Um, and then another part of that is you could have some sort of reward, like 
if I, you know, I'm able to not fall into this, you know, then I have some sort of little celebration, you know, you celebrate the little victories. That's like a common thing, even in, you know, secular wisdom. Um, and I think that we could apply that to our spiritual life as well um, to have some like checkpoints or a realization of, okay, we, we have victory. You know, when you have victory, like what, like you celebrate victory, right. You know, in a war or in, in sports or whatever it is. And so um, having some sort of, you know, victory celebration or mini rewards here and there, I think actually can be very helpful. Um, and, and because it's, you say, well, doesn't that just kind of dilute? Like if I say I can have like a chocolate bar because, you know, this day I, I didn't fall into this temptation, you know, does that dilute it? Well, not really because um, what that does is it shows what's most important, you know, if all your life's goal is just to not eat a chocolate bar, like that's how a lot of people see Lent, you know, uh, that's a pretty like low bar to live for <laughs> no pun intended. Um, <laughs> and, uh, what, what would be better is to say, like, there are priorities. This thing is way more important. If I can unroot this predominant fault, so many other good things are going to come from it. I'm going to live so much more ordered, live so much more for God, much greater charity, you know? And so like mortifying myself from a little sweet here is like way down in the corner in terms of what's most important. And, and, and so having little like celebrations that aren't sinful, you know, is actually helpful, I would say. So um, yeah, I was going to say the reason those little goals are not a big deal or not negative is because no one really starts out on this great battle to overcome certain things just because they want to get that little treat. I mean, they were oh, just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it's a small thing. It's like anything. It's whatever you're, you're studying to pass a class or to get a PhD. And you tell yourself every time I make this milestone, I'll give myself this little treat. Well, you, you're not doing them for the little treat. You ultimately, you know, whatever you wanted the PhD, you wanted to graduate from college, whatever it might be. So similarly here, I think in the spiritual life. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to say the other thing I've heard too, that I think can help a lot is if you do know your predominant fault, uh, the vice that it might be, always the vices have their opposing virtues and so then do your best to practice the opposite virtue yeah. uh, the more you can practice the virtue which is opposed to that vice then you know the more you'll you'll be overcoming it because you'll be developing the opposite so for example you know, let's just say you, you you lack patience and you get angry very easily well then you might need to be looking at well exercising patience slowing yourself down or exercising meekness right meekness is you know, we have a right to get angry because an injustice has been committed against us, but we hold that anger in check. And so meekness actually requires you to be really strong. It's like the horse is out of control. That's your anger. That's your emotion. And so the, the meek man is able to harness that very strong horse, his own anger, uh, and, and put him under control. So, you know, a lot of people think of meekness in a totally, it's not mousy. It's not the wrong yeah. thing. But, but again, you know, so you exercise meekness to combat it if you are sort of very ang a very angry person. Um, and, and God will provide you with situations in which you can be meek. Uh, and you can also try to exercise that because the more you can actually, uh, attack that predominant fault, because as we said, it's a root, what you start finding out is by attacking the predominant fault, there might be a lot of other sins in your life that start being reduced and start going away without you necessarily even focusing that much on them, but it's because you were getting at the root that, you know, you're striking at the root. So naturally these others are going to go away. Um, and so that's why it's really important, I think, also to try to develop that particular virtue that stands in uh, th that's the corrective, the antidote, the medicine um, against your predominant fault, whatever ver whatever vice you really fall into. Definitely. Yeah, 100 percent. Good deal. Well, I, there's a lot more to cover. Right. Um, yep. But uh, we'll do that in the next show. We'll continue talking about self-knowledge, predominant faults, temperaments. Uh, those are things that also interest me a lot because uh, that's what we need for self-growth. Let's go ahead and close with a prayer. Absolutely. All right, I'll lead that. Uh, in nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus Tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris, tu Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, Pray for us. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. God willing, we'll see you soon. Thanks, David. God bless you and everyone. Mm -hmm.